Hello, Keith Rucker here at VintageMachinery.org. Guys, uh, today, working on the 10 E lathe restoration, this has been a back burner project for me, but I'm ready to kind of move forward on at least part of this and kind of getting things staged and ready to be able to do some things down the road. Now, I've got the main casting for the base of it here, and uh, there's a couple of things I need to do. Number one, I need to gut this thing. I need to get all the, the components that are in this, the, there's a, basically there's a motor generator set on one side. Uh, if you're not familiar with the, this particular version, uh, this is, they, Monarch made several variations as far as the electronics go on these 10 double Zs. This machine I think was made in 43 if I remember right. We'll look at the tag in a little bit and confirm that. But uh, at that time, it was really was before when they had the models with the tubes in them that I think a lot of people are familiar with. So the way this uh, machine here is designed is you've got a big direct current motor down this end uh, and it's a big motor you'll see it when we pull it out and it's designed for variable speed and, and back in the days again this is in the 40s they didn't have all the technology we have now with things like variable frequency drives and so forth uh, really do a good job and have torque at low end uh, they use dc motors for that a lot now, of course, you didn't have direct current motors or direct current electricity in most shops at that time. Everything had pretty much gone to alternating current by the 1940s. Uh, so to make the, the direct current, you got a motor generator on this end down here. So there's a three phase motor on the top that's belted to a direct current generator on the bottom that generates the direct current power. And then they've got, there's just, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, crude Frankenstein looking electronics to be able to do the variable speed and so forth uh, that would then power the big motor on this end. I want to get all of that pulled out. And my plan is, is we're going to keep the, uh, the drive motor, but instead of having the motor generator and having all the 1940s electronics in here, we're going to upgrade that to a more modern uh, DC drive uh, that basically does the same thing and uh, it's very similar in size and form factor to a variable frequency drive like you would use with an alternating current motor. Um, and we can pretty much get all of the controls and everything hooked up to it where it works the same way. You use the same controls as you did originally, uh, but greatly simplified and just a lot more efficient. And the electronics on this one is a basket case. And I'm not an electronics guy. I'm not even about to try to figure all this stuff out and try to get it working. And talking to people that have this particular lathe, uh, they say they're finicky. You know, you get them running, everything's running good, and then things get, well, they're not running good. And you have to go in there and tweak the electronics. I don't want to go there. That's not my thing. I'm not an electronics guy. So uh, I, I want to just be able to go use my machine. That's my game plan. Now, I will say that um, the, a lot of the electronics that's in this lathe is going to be donated to, uh, what is it, the Minneapolis Streetcar Museum, I think it is, up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They've got a 10 E of this same era. In fact, it's, it's the serial numbers are really close on them. And uh, they're trying to get theirs running and they're trying to, to keep things original. So I've already been, they've already contacted me about getting some parts off of this. So at some point in time, I don't know if everything's gonna go up there, but a good part of the electronics on this machine are gonna go up there to them. And uh, because they're a streetcar museum, they are a lot more qualified to deal with the electronics in this thing because let's face it, streetcars in the 1940s use very similar stuff. So they, they can figure it out. And I'm not saying I couldn't, but that's just not my specialty. So here's the game plan today. We're gonna go ahead, I'm gonna come in here with the gantry crane. We're gonna pick this whole thing up, put it up on these saw horses. That's for no other reason than, so I won't have to get down on the floor pulling all this stuff out. I can get it up in a height that's a little bit easier to work at, and we're gonna get it out. Once I get this casting stripped down, the game plan is, is I'm gonna send this out and have it sandblasted and primed, very similar to what I did with the Jimmy Duresta bandsaw. Worked out really good, uh, saved me a lot of time and effort rather than having to do it with wire wheels and so forth like that. So um, I'm gonna just go ahead and get this ready so that in the next week or two, I can get it over to them and let them get it stand blasted and primed. Then we can start working on getting this base ready to rebuild the rest of the machine on. All right, let's get in here and see if we can get this uh, thing stripped down. Guys, change of plan. Instead of using the gantry to pick this up, I'm gonna use the tractor with the forks. 
Um, I was going to have to put straps up there on the bottom. They weren't going to be equal because of this little hump on the front. And I was worried they may slide in. There's nothing up underneath there to keep it from sliding in. So we're just going to use the forks. I know this uh, sun's blowing you out, but that's the best I can do right now. So we're going to go ahead and pick her up and set her down. All right, I think that's gonna make it much easier to work on. So uh, this is uh, real good and solid. I can still use the gantry to help get these components, these motors and generators and stuff out of here. All right, let's uh, continue on. All right, first things first, I need to disconnect the wiring that comes out of this box. This just looks like a junction box, basically, where the wires uh, go from one end to the other. Uh, just, it's just a place for them to terminate and connect. Now, I'm not gonna worry about trying to save this wiring. This wiring is, is gonna be thrown away. So uh, we're just gonna come in here with some wire cutters and we're just gonna cut all these wires. Uh, I think that's got all of them on the bottom one down there. And we got black wires up here. And there we go. So now, let me see if I can uh, get those uh, bushings off the end of the conduit and just pull the conduit out. <clears throat> we'll squirt a little bit of uh, penetrating oil on these caps. Sure ain't gonna hurt nothing because they are a little rusty. And a pair of channel locks. And that looks like it's gonna come off. One down. All right, I think we can pull that out. Now this motor generator set is uh, got some motor mounts down here that have a hex drive socket in it. So we're gonna come in here and see if we can get these out. There's one, there's four of these holding in the, around that motor. So I'm gonna go around and get all those out and I think we'll be ready to pull that motor generator set out. You can see the motor generator set. The motor's on the top, the generator's on the bottom and got more. I've already pulled one of them out over here, but you got another motor mount right here. Ah, okay, there it comes. I was gonna say it's gonna be stubborn. We got it. One more to go, I'll get that one out and uh, we'll see if we can pull this out. All right, I think what we're gonna try to do is I got this hooked up to the gantry. We're gonna try to use that to kind of pick this thing up and see if I can kind of shift it out of there a little bit. And we got one side picked up. That's exactly what I want. Sounds like starting to rain. All 
All right, let's see if we can pull up on that. I don't have a strap just the right length there, but hopefully we can get that to pull up enough to pull it out of there. There we go. On this side of the lathe, we got the big DC drive motor, and it's a monster motor that's up in here. Um, and one thing I'll note that's kind of interesting about it, and one of the reasons why I definitely want to reuse this motor is that it has a high, low range um, gearbox built into the frame of the motor. So the shaft comes through here. This is the, the pulley shaft that goes up to drive the lathe. And there's a selector switch here. When it's, see, when it's up, if you look, it's turning one to one. So the motor's turning and this is turning at the same RPMs. When you go down, notice that the motor's turning much faster. So this is kind of the slower gears. So you can get down to those slower gears, still have the motor running at a higher RPM and have your torque uh, that you really want to have. So um, anyway, we're going to try to use this motor. As far as I know, this motor should be in good shape. Um, it was running when the guy who was using it before me um, got it out. The, this was not what died. The electronics is what died. So I'm optimistic and it looks good. All right, so this motor is mounted on this plate down here. See the motor's going on the plate and the plate has three motor mounts on it, two on the front and one in the back. Bear in mind that um, this side here is wider than the main part up in there. So they only have one uh, in there. So let's see if we can get these out. Here's number one. Easy peasy. See, this one's going to require the little universal joint to be able to get down there to it. But there she comes. And one more in the back. That one's going to be hard to show you, but you see the point. I think we are ready here to see if we can pull this motor out. Hopefully it'll be as easy as the other side. So we're going to pick up on this one side. And that does have everything kind of sliding toward me here. Up on that piece of conduit there. I think I can, yeah, that's going to be perfect. That should lift from the front end, the back of the motor there. So we can kind of get it free hanging coming out of here. There we go. All right, and we'll, I'm just going to put this one on this table here. We'll just move the gantry forward. There we go. Motors are removed. So I think we got everything out of the inside of the casting here, except for some conduit and electrical stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and pull all that stuff out. And uh, yeah, I think this will be ready to go to sandblasting. 
Wow, that actually went a lot easier than I anticipated. Love those kinds of surprises. All right, I'll get that out. I won't bore you with uh, removing conduit, but we'll get that out of there and uh, we'll be done. Got all the conduit, all the electrical stuff is completely removed from the casting now. I wanna go ahead and take off these uh, name badges. There's a Monarch badge right here. So we'll just go ahead and pull this off real quick. It almost looks like it's made out of brass, but I can't imagine that being made out of brass with this being a World War II era machine. But dang it, it sure doesn't look like it. Huh. That is probably what the original color of this machine was, um, which makes sense. This is a war machine, and while there are no badges on it, that says uh, that it's made in uh, accordance to the War Production Board, it would have been made in accordance to the War Production Board, and it would have had what's called a war finish on it. And a war finish during World War II, uh, basically they didn't put any like body fillers on these machines, they didn't put any um, primer, they just basically came in and painted them black. Uh, that was considered a war finish, and it was an effort to save time and money and get machines cranked out for the war effort. So uh, that makes sense as to what the uh, original color would have been on this. This, is, this would have been a war finish machine, I'm sure. Uh, so I don't think I'm going to go back to that color. I haven't decided on a color yet, but uh, probably not black. But we got one more badge over here we need to get taken off. This is the serial number tag and it does have the date. I said 43, 10, 1942 is when uh, this machine was built. It says the catalog size and model is a 10 inch double E, which is what this is. Actual swing is uh, 12 and a half inches. Distance between centers, 20 inches. Uh, manufacturer's number was at 19005. I have no idea what that is. Um, Buyer's machine number is blank. Uh, date built, uh, like I said, it's 10, 1942, and cost installed is blank. We need to get this tag off. These are uh, drive pins, and I was feeling in there to see if those are through holes or not. So uh, let me, I got a special pair of pliers that you do a pretty good job of grabbing those. Several years ago, I had a viewer send me this pair of pliers made by Vampire Tools, INT, and you pull this little thing off and it's got a round thing in the front that usually does a pretty good job of coming in and grabbing these drive screws. Still takes a little bit of work, uh, but I have gotten a lot of drive screws out with this pair of pliers. So let me see if I can uh, grip these. I may have to kind of chisel them out a little bit. These drive screws, if you're not familiar with them, they're really aggravating. Um, they're pretty much made to go in and not come out. I see, I think I got that one coming out. So um, they are, maybe not. These drive screws are um, kind of corrugated and have little flutes in them to where they all kind of spin. You just drill a hole and drive them in. All right, I'm gonna have to get something behind this and see if I can get those out just a little bit. I've in the past just used a sacrificial chisel to do that. Let me see if I can do that. Up wood chisel here, and I'm gonna see if I can get behind it just enough to kind of get it coming out. See there, that one came out just a little bit bottom one wants to be a little bit more stubborn. Actually, the top drive screws already popped out. And uh, that's what will happen. I'll replace those drive screws with new screws. Now I think I can grip that one. There you go, you can see that drive screw. Put 
There we go, got it. And uh, we'll clean that tag up when we do the restoration. It's got that war finish black behind it as well. Last little bit to come off here, these little uh, brackets here. I believe these were for, there was a um, collet closer that came with these lays. And I think that that held a little uh, rod that went through the headstock for that collet closer when it wasn't being used. I believe that's what these are for. You see them on a lot of Monarch lays. All right. Well, I said I had everything, and then I realized I didn't have everything. We've got this little bracket here. I see Get the right one. It's got a little T-slot in it. This was for holding. I can't remember what, but over here on the headstock end, it held something, I think, with a drive system. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and just take it off. And it's just got a couple of socket cap screws uh, going through there holding it in place. I don't think that needs to be sandblasted. All right, one other thing I want to do before we send this off for sandblasting is there's six holes, four on the, this side and two on the other, that the lathe bed bolts down to. And we sent that lathe bed to get it ground. And I noticed when I took these off, there were little brass shims up underneath this. And um, I'm sure that it has to do with getting the lathe perfectly level. I really don't want to, this is a ground surface on here. I really don't want this surface that these are going to bolt down to to be sandblasted. So what I'm going to do is I got a little brass brush here. I'm going to start by just getting that little bit of rust off of there, getting down to a good clean surface like such. And um, I'm just going to take a 5 8 inch washer and put on here. And I'm going to take a bolt and put through it and tighten them up. And that will just protect these surfaces uh, when it's being sandblasted so that it doesn't sandblast right up underneath where all those shims went. And that'll pretty much be exactly like the original because, you know, there is a shim in there. It's not making contact all the way around but we will be shimming down. We won't be altering that surface uh, with the sandblasting. So I'm gonna clean those up and get that ready. And uh, then I think we will finally be through with this. Well guys, with that, I think uh, this is ready to go to sandblasting. So that's pretty much gonna be a wrap on this video. That's all I wanted to get done today was to get everything out of this so that we could get it over there in the next couple of weeks for sandblasting. Now, um, I'm actually shooting this video it's New Year's Eve, 2021. So, uh, uh, and come this Sunday, uh, I'm flying out. January is always a crazy, crazy month for me travel-wise, uh, going to a lot of meetings and stuff for work. So uh, uh, it's probably gonna be a couple of weeks before I can get it down there to be sandblasted, but hopefully they can, uh, they can get this thing knocked out pretty quick, get it back up here. Like I said earlier in the video, this is the foundation that we'll build the rest of this lathe on. So uh, this is kind of the first thing we need to get done. Um, and then we can work on getting that lathe bed mounted to it. We're gonna have to do, of course, uh, um, getting it cleaned up. Well, it will be cleaned up in prime when I get it back, but I'll probably have to put some body filler on it, do some sanding uh, before it'll be ready for its real coat of paint. I gotta decide what color I wanna paint it. I've been thinking about that. There's so many options. I always have a hard time with that. Uh, but uh, anyway, we'll, we'll see what that ends up being. But with that, guys, that is going to be a wrap on this video, this episode. Uh, as always, thanks for watching. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thumbs up and comments are appreciated. Uh, hit that bell icon up there to get notifications when new videos are posted. And uh, with that, we'll catch you on the next video. Again, thanks for watching.